Um, and with that, we'll get started. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, biogeochemical stressors and the ecological response in Great Bay Estuary located on the border of New Hampshire and Maine. Um, Uh, so globally, estuaries are worth an estimated value of $4 trillion based on estimates done by Constanza et al. in 1997. And this valuation comes from a variety of ecosystem services that estuaries provide, whether that's regulating services such as flood control, supporting services like nutrient cycling, cultural ecosystem services like recreation, and provisioning services like commercial and sustenance fishing. And all of these different types of ecosystem services require both nutrients and energy in order to continue to sustain estuarine ecosystems. And those different forms of nutrients and energy can be broken down into several categories. The first being the total nitrogen pool, which is the summation of particulate nitrogen and dissolve, total dissolved nitrogen. And the difference between the two pools is particulate nitrogen is any material that is retained on a filter and the dissolved nitrogen pool is anything that passes through that filter. And so some examples of particulate nitrogen include any kind of detritus material, whether that's from leaf litter breaking down or macroalgae decomposing in an estuarine system. And now on the total dissolved nitrogen pool side, that can be further broken down into the dissolved inorganic nitrogen pool and the dissolved organic nitrogen pool with the main difference being inorganic sources of nitrogen are often anthropogenically sourced, whether that's wastewater treatment effluent or septic system drainage. And dissolved organic nitrogen is most often naturally sourced and often coming from wetlands. In addition, besides nitrogen, another important nutrient to estuarine ecosystems is phosphorus and specifically um, the inorganic form orthophosphate. And this often originates from anthropogenic sources as well, including septic systems shown here on the right. In addition to nutrients, estuaries also require a source of energy, that being carbon. Um, and more specifically, I look a lot at dissolved organic carbon, which is often naturally derived from wetlands and fuels marine food webs. And this picture here on the right shows uh, coastal marine waters across the United Kingdom. And you can see as you move from the left side of the photo to the right, the water becomes browner, indicating an increase in soil-derived DOC reaching that estuarine system. And all of these nutrients and energy sources um, are delivered to estuaries via the water cycle. Um, globally, estuaries are estimated to receive about 27% of surface freshwater discharge in the form of coastal runoff and river discharge. And within that freshwater discharge, they receive about 25% of total organic carbon land to ocean fluxes and 34% of nitrogen land to ocean fluxes. Other freshwater sources to estuaries that can contribute nutrients and carbon include direct groundwater seepage, uh, precipitation either as rainfall or snowfall, and then the flux of the tides coming in from the ocean and going back out can bring in and remove materials as well. And now once these nutrients and carbon reach an estuarine ecosystem, it's the responsibility of the biogeochemical cycles to process those inputs. And there are several different pathways by which um, nutrients and carbon can be processed upon reaching an estuary. The first being gaseous loss to the atmosphere, for examples of which include um, denitrification, which is um, when nitrate is converted to dinitrogen gas during in anaerobic conditions or the um, consumption of carbon and subsequent outgassing of CO2. Additionally, nutrients can be taken up by aquatic plants via biotic assimilation and incorporated into their biomass. And the sediment bed has also been shown to be both a release and a sink of both nutrients and carbon in estuarine ecosystems. And if an estuary is not capable of processing all of those inputs of nutrients and carbon, anything that's left over is exported out to the coastal ocean. So because estuaries provide all these valuable ecosystem services, we as humans tend to live on coastlines. Um, and the UN estimates that 37% of our global population lives within 100 kilometers of the coastlines. 
And you can see that visually represented here with this global population density map in 3D. And so the taller the spikes are on the map, that means there's a higher population density. And what's cool about this is you can see the outline of all the continents minus Antarctica, um, which just really visually shows you that people tend to accumulate along coastlines. If we zoom in more closely to the US, we see that about 40% of the US population lives along coastal areas. And that's visually shown here with a population density map by county with the dark blue colors indicating higher population densities and the majority of those dark blue colors occurring along coastlines along the US. And so since the majority or a lot of our population lives on coastlines, we tend to see the effects of that on, in our coastal systems. Um, one of the biggest being um, eutrophication caused by excessive nutrient inputs. And eutrophication is the stimulation of algal blooms due to excess nutrients being inputted into a coastal system. The result is when those algal blooms die, um, they start to decompose and get processed by the system resulting in hypoxia events. And this can lead to even broader consequences like fish kills. And we can see the effect of hum the human imprint the human footprint on um, coastal areas here with this map from Diaz and Rosenberg 2008, where um, our human footprint is expressed as a percentage across the globe with the darker purple colors um, indicating higher human footprint. And anywhere where we see these darker colors, we also see white circles indicating hypoxic systems have been found there. And the way in which humans exert this um, nutrient input, these excess nutrient inputs um, to coastal systems is by yeah, creating an imbalance in our nutrient fluxes. Most commonly, most commonly, that can be seen as septic, or sorry, wastewater treatment plant effluent or agricultural system fertilizer and cow manure running off from the landscape or even living in a suburb and having a leaky septic system or over fertilizing your lawn or not picking up after your pets in your yard. Um, and so nutrients, excess nutrient inputs and an imbalance in estuarine ecosystems can have a lot of ramifications, but it also can affect specific estuarine habitats in different ways. Um, and one of the least studied thus far um, in the literature is seagrass decline. Um, and seagrass decline is being observed globally and this map shows essentially the number of studies on seagrass coverage by region. Um, so the larger the pie chart is, the more studies there have been. And anywhere where we see a majority of red within the pie chart, that indicates that most studies are finding seagrass decline. Um, and seagrass decline, or more specifically eelgrass in some parts of the world, is thought to be due to a combination of nutrient loading and the uh, light limitation, where in a low nutrient environment, uh, eelgrass is able to receive sufficient sunlight to grow, thrive, and spread throughout an estuary and perform its essential ecosystem services. But when we overload that estuarine ecosystem with excess nutrients, the competitors to eelgrass, which are usually phytoplankton and macroalgae species, start to outcompete and grow faster and go over top of that eelgrass, essentially shading the eelgrass out and preventing it from reaching or receiving sufficient sunlight to grow. And this can lead to die off of eelgrass. An eelgrass decline in estuarine systems is really problematic because it means a loss of ecosystem services. Specifically, eelgrass decline can lead to a loss of habitat as juvenile fish often use eelgrass beds for nurseries. And this in turn can hurt commercial and sustenance fishing industries. Additionally, a loss of eelgrass can result in higher turbidity as eelgrass traditionally attenuates waves and promotes sedimentation. And finally, a loss of eelgrass means a removal of essential nitrogen filtration and carbon sequestration services. Um, and so my research focused on a specific estuary where there's this intersection of high nutrient loading and eelgrass decline to get at um, this um, confluence of these stressors and ecological responses. And so I looked at um, Great Bay Estuary located on the border of New Hampshire and Maine. Um, and this estuary discharges to the Gulf of Maine. And it is currently designated as nitrogen impaired. 
And we can see that that's partly due to the 17 uh, different wastewater treatment plants shown on the map on the right, um, indicated by these pink and red dots um, that discharge uh, nutrients into the, from the watershed into Great Bay estuary. And this uh, confluence of nitrogen loading to Great Bay has also corresponded with a drastic decline in the estuary's eelgrass. Most notably, um, over a half of Great Bay's eelgrass has disappeared in the last two decades. And we can visually see that when we compare a 1995 aerial image um, cover to the 2015 cover. And this is very problematic in Great Bay because we are losing a lot of those essential ecosystem services that eelgrass provides. So much so that an ec economic analysis um, has estimated that restoration of Great Bay's uh, ecosystems, including eelgrass beds, oyster reefs, and salt marshes, could actually save wastewater treatment plants between 21 and $24 million a year by restoring that natural nitrogen filtration capacity of the estuary. Uh, in addition, I'm very excited to be studying Great Bay at this time because we're kind of at a new crossroads um, as our seacoast communities have moved to start upgrading wastewater treatment plants to include secondary treatment. Um, and uh, the recent release of a final permit um, for total nitrogen loading to Great Bay in an effort to reduce inorganic nitrogen loads. Um, and for the first time in many years, we've begun um, restoration efforts and led by PrEP and others to um, see if we can get eelgrass to start growing in places where it's historically been gone for some time. And so that brings me to where my research comes in to this uh, landscape of biogeochemistry, eelgrass health, and the Great Bay case study um, with two research questions. The first being, how do patterns of input retention and output of nutrients, carbon, and sediments vary temporally in Great Bay? And the second being, how do those above patterns in water quality influence biotic response in the estuary measured as eelgrass coverage, chlorophyll A concentrations, and net ecosystem metabolism. And so um, while the whole Great Bay estuarine system is nitrogen impaired, my work focused specifically on Great Bay, which is this portion shown in the, block, in the box um, south of Little Bay and this point referred to as Adams Point. Um, as a whole, though, Great Bay Estuary is a well-mixed system, meaning that there is no horizontal or vertical stratification of the water column, and total freshwater input to the system is about 2% of the tidal prism, which is the amount of ocean water that moves in and out of the system in a given day. And on average, a given freshwater parcel that enters Great Bay will reside within the estuary between 5 and 20 days. Now, more specific, as we zoom in um, into Great Bay, um, we, uh, between monitoring efforts of the UNH Water Quality Lab, the Piscataqua Region Estuaries Partnership, and New Hampshire DES, we have a lot of water quality monitoring that's capturing a lot of key inputs and outputs in terms of nutrients and carbon for our system. And we can see this heat represented on the map with our three key watersheds in orange, green, and purple, those being the Lamprey, the Squam Scott, and the Winnicott. And we have three tidal tributary stations that monitor uh, water chemistry. Those are represented by the white circles. Additionally, estuarine water chemistry is monitored at a high tide and low tide point at Adams Point represented by the tan circle. There are also three wastewater treatment facilities that discharge below the head of tide or below our tributary monitoring stations. Those are shown in the black circles and they are New Market, New Fields and Exeter. And those stations are important to point out because, because they are below the head of tide, they are not captured in the tributary monitoring station data. And finally, the UNH Water Quality Lab maintains a precipitation volume and rain chemistry monitoring station within the Lamprey River watershed. And for the purposes of my work, we assume that the rainfall chemistry captured there is an, approximate, is an approximation of what falls directly onto Great Bay. And across all these monitoring sites, we have a range of solutes that are measured for concentration at a monthly time step. And so those include, if we go across the top of this table, total nitrogen, particulate nitrogen, dissolved inorganic nitrogen, orthophosphate, dissolved organic carbon, 
and total suspended solids. And our tributary and estuarine monitoring stations are, are monitored at a monthly time step between March and December of each year for the purposes of this study between 2008 and 2018 and are run for all of these analy analytical um, solutes. In addition, at the precipitation station, we collect weekly samples of our uh, precipitation volumes and do chemistry on those. Um, and we measure the same suite of solutes minus particulate nitrogen and total suspended solids. And that's because we assume those to be negligible in uh, rainfall and snowfall. In addition to these tributary estuarine and precipitation monitoring stations, I also looked for other um, inputs to Great Bay that could be accounted for either from the literature or from estimates. And those include uh, an estimate of direct groundwater flux into the system. And that was pulled from Ballastero et al. 2004. Um, additionally, any coastal runoff not accounted for by the tributary watersheds was estimated using a scalar relationship between the Lamprey River watersheds runoff and air coastal watershed area for Great Bay. And then finally, those three wastewater treatment plants, uh, Newfields, New Market, and Exeter, um, were compiled. I compiled data for those either from facility monitoring reports with the help of people from the UNH Water Quality Lab, and then estimated unknown um, solute chemistry based on known C to N and N to P ratios for other wastewater treatment plants in the watershed. Now, this is a lot of solute concentration data to work with. Um, and that can be a really valuable thing to have, but sometimes we're more interested in the rate of delivery of solutes to a, to a body of water. In that case, we're talking about a solute load, which helps us to describe a delivery rate or the rate of accumulation in the receiving body of water. And so I then took all of my concentration data and pulled USGS, USGS gauge data for the rivers to get discharged and calculated loads as the product of concentration and discharge. Um, and this helps us better understand the rate at which Great Bay receives things like nitrogen and carbon. And so with all this solute load data, I was then able to plug everything in to a black box model, which I'll get into next. So a black box model um, essentially is a way of looking at how an ecosystem functions whereby we ignore everything going on inside the ecosystem and we pretend it's not there. And instead, we measure all of our inputs as I've been describing and our outputs from the system. And the difference between our inputs and outputs gives us a delta storage term, which helps us infer whether our system is retaining its inputs or exporting and producing additional things within the system. A black box model treats our treats whatever body ecosystem of interest, in this case an estuary, as a single vertically and horizontally well-mixed box. So we assume that anything that enters the box has an equal chance of being processed and exported. And so if we wanted to look at our specific inputs for Great Bay, um, we would return back to our concept of the water cycle and how things are delivered to estuarine ecosystems. And so we can divide our inputs into a couple different categories. The first being on the left, non-point sources, including things like tr our tributary loads, our groundwater direct seepage and coastal runoff. Uh, we then have any direct atmospheric wet deposition that falls onto the estuary. Um, additionally, point sources being three wastewater treatment facilities that are downstream of our tributary monitoring stations. And lastly, anything that's coming in with the high tide flux into Great Bay. Then we can add all our inputs up and we can subtract out our low tide um, flux, which is our one output from this system. And the difference between those gives us our delta storage. Now there are three potential outcomes of a black box model that help us infer the fate of nutrients. The first being that our inputs and our outputs are equal meaning that solutes are moving conservatively through the system and are not reacting. And this indicates that our system is balanced. Our second potential outcome is that inputs are greater than our outcoming or outgoing flow or our outputs. And this indicates the net import or the retention and permanent loss of materials upon entry into our black box. Our third possible outcome 
is that inputs are less than outputs, and this is indicative of net export or in situ production, meaning if there's not enough coming in to support that high output flux, Great Bay somewhere inside is producing additional sources of that solute of interest. And so in order to apply a uh, box model to an estuarine system, we first have to determine whether we can detect the influence of our rivers on our estuarine water chemistry. And we can do that by assessing the relationship between freshwater inputs and salinity. And so here we have a scatter plot with the x-axis showing the total volume of freshwater inputs per day to Great Bay. And on the y-axis, we have low tide salinity um, in practical salinity scale units. Um, and for reference, oceanic water is about 35 on this type of scale. And so we can see that as our freshwater input increases, we see a decrease in our salinity at low tide, which indicates that that freshwater is coming into Great Bay, is mixing, and we have an equal likelihood of any of those freshwater inputs, solutes within that freshwater being processed or exported from the system. Additionally, before we can fully evaluate our box model, we can sometimes take a step back and look just at our solute concentrations across our rivers and our estuarine system. Um, and what I mean by that is our black box balance can depend on the magnitude of our inputs. And so if we see, look here across the X axis is a sampling date from 2008 to 2018. And on the Y axis, we have dissolved organic carbon concentrations in milligrams of carbon per liter. And these yellow and orange lines are high and low tide concentrations respectively. And we can see that they follow each other very closely, which indicates that, um, and I have backed this up with statistical testing, that um, there's no difference between high tide and low tide concentrations in DOC. Um, and this means that if the estuarine water chemistry for DOC is showing no difference, then the black box model is going to be dependent on what our freshwater inputs are showing. And so if we look at our tributary concentrations, um, we can see that all three of our rivers shown in purple here have a much higher DOC concentration on a given sampling date. And that the range in tributary DOC is much greater than the range in estuarine DOC. And so this just gives us kind of a snapshot look of what we might expect to be happening in Great Bay. Um, because if the estuarine chemistry is the same, then really our black box is just dependent on whether our inputs are greater or less than the estuarine chemistry. There is a cave caveat to that, in that if you look just at concentrations, you're not considering the potential dilution effect as the tributary water enters Great Bay's basin. Um, but it's a good first thing to look at and consider. Finally, with all of my solute loads, black box model calculations completed, I was also able to look at biotic response variables in relation to that. And those biotic response, response variables include annual eelgrass coverage, which is shown here on the right, um, dating from 1996 to 2018 on the x-axis and coverage in acres on the y-axis. Chlorophyll A concentrations, which are measured at both our high tide and low tide sampling point at Adams Point. Um, and this is the annual average just shown as a scatter line plot with the low tide concentrations in blue and the high tide concentrations in gray on average for a given year. And lastly, I calculated um, net ecosystem metabolism, which is the difference between production and respiration in a system or basically the change in amount of oxygen. Um, and so net ecosystem metabolism is just calculated as a difference between gross primary productivity or photosynthesis and production of oxygen and ecosystem respiration, which is anything that is consuming organic matter and consuming oxygen. And there are two possible outcomes for a net ecosystem metabolism calculation. The first being that NEM is positive, which indicates that autotrophic processes or photosynthetic processes are dominating the system, and there's a net production of organic matter. The other possible outcome is that net ecosystem metabolism is negative. This indicates that heterotrophic processes are dominating and that there's a net consumption of organic matter within the system. And so now with all of my methods now described, we can get into some of my results. <laughs> 
The first being that Great Bay is a net exporter of total nitrogen, meaning that inputs are less than outputs from the system. So if we look at this figure on the left, um, on the x-axis, we have our individual calendar years for our 10-year period of study. And on the y-axis, we have our total nitrogen yield, which is the load of nitrogen normalized by the surface area of Great Bay at mean high tide. And we can see the purple bars, which represent input loads in a given year, are lower than the blue bars, which represent our output loads in a given year. And the dashed lines across the plot show the uh, decadal average for inputs and outputs. And so we can see on average um, across the 10-year period, output is greater than our input load. We can visualize this as a delta storage term, which is the figure on the right, where um, in years where our delta storage value is positive, that indicates our net import. But for total nitrogen, the majority of our years exhibit net export where those inputs are less than our outputs. Additionally, particulate nitrogen exhibits similar behavior um, as a net exporter within, as being a net export product within Great Bay. So we again see that inputs are less than our outputs from the system. We have a very similar plot on the left. This time it's particulate nitrogen yield, which is our load normalized by our surface area. And we see again that on average, our inputs are less than our outputs, indicating that Great Bay is producing some additional source within the black box that's contributing to that net export. If we look at that as a delta storage term, we see almost every year except for 2017 shows net export status with a negative delta storage value. And total nitrogen and particulate nitrogen export is thought to be a function of residence time in estuarine systems. And so this is a figure from Nixon et al. in 1996. Um, and they looked at a suite of estuaries across sizes, eutrophication status, and climate types ranging from temperate to tropical. And they found that there is a strong relationship between residence time or how long about a, part, a parcel of water remains in the system and the total percent of nitrogen inputs that are exported from the system. And so if we just think about this in the context of Great Bay, which has a residence time of between five and 20 days, which is less than a month on this x-axis scale, we'd expect on the regression line Great Bay to fall somewhere between 80 and 90% of total nitrogen export. We can't directly compare to this graph, mostly because Nixon and all and I differed in how we described inputs and exports, but it gives us a good ballpark estimate that we can say with confidence that our net export um, result makes sense in the context of a lot of estuaries globally. Additionally, the net export of particulate materials from estuaries is thought to be driven by tidal currents during outgoing or ebbing tides. And we can look at that in terms of total suspended solids concentrations in Great Bay. And so this is a box plot of our high tide and low tide um, total suspended solid concentrations for Great Bay over the 10 year period of monitoring. And we see that there is a statistically significant difference um, between our mean uh, high tide concentration and our mean low tide concentration with the low tide being higher. And when we compare this to other estuaries and globally, we find that many observe this, including um, Baird et al. 1987, which looked at a South African estuary, and those means are shown with the green triangles on the box plot. Additionally, net export of particulate and total nitrogen and of sediments is, can be driven by the loss of eelgrass, as I alluded to in my introduction, as the loss of eelgrass can accelerate sediment resus resuspension. So if we begin on the left side of this figure from Hansen and Redenbach 2013, um, we see that this is a box plot, box and whiskers plot of, um, of shear stress or the force required to initiate sediment resuspension and kick things back up into the water column. The red line on the box plots indicates the critical shear stress threshold or the minimum force value required to um, initiate sediment resuspension off the um, sediment bed. Um, and we can see if we compare the box and whisker plot from the unvegetated site to a seagrass metal that our um, shear stress values are much lower. And in some cases for the seagrass meadow fall below the resuspension 
critical shear stress threshold. Um, and this meaning that the seagrass mano is attenuating wave currents and thereby reducing the likelihood that you'll hit enough force to initiate that resuspension. This is further supported if we look at the green lines on these two plots, which are average total suspended solid concentrations over time at the two sites, um, with the average TSS concentrations being higher in the unvegetated site due to sediment resuspension and lower in the seagrass meadow due to the attenuation of wave currents and promotion of sedimentation. And this is um, this finding by Hansen and Rennebach, we can kind of think about in the terms of Great Bay's black box model when we look at the total suspended solids model results. And on every year of the study where I had data, we had a negative export, um, our net export and a negative delta storage value meaning that on average, there was less total suspended solids entering Great Bay than leaving, which means that somewhere within our black box, there's an additional source of those sediments. And it's likely sediment resuspension as this is occurring at the same time that we've had eel grass decline throughout the estuary. Now, if we move from the particulate fraction of nitrogen in estuarine ecosystems to the dissolved inorganic fractions, we find that we see the opposite behavior with Great Bay retaining the majority of dissolved inorganic nitrogen that it receives. And so here we have a very similar plot um, with on the Y, on the X axis, we have annual year. And on the Y axis, we have our dissolved inorganic nitrogen yield, which is our load of nitrogen, either input or output normalized by surface area. And we see that on average, our inputs in purple are greater than our outputs in blue. This indicates a majority positive delta storage terms or the net import of nitrogen into the system. And this difference between the net import of dissolved inorganic nitrogen and the net export of particulate nitrogen in Great Bay is, is indicative of a switch between nitrogen pools within Great Bay itself. And what I mean by that is our rivers and our wastewater treatment facilities are providing dissolved inorganic nitrogen to the system. And that is in the forms that primary producers prefer, that nitrate and that ammonium. And so our eelgrass, our phytoplankton, and our macroalgae species like Gracilaria are taking up that dissolved inorganic nitrogen, um, converting it into biomass, and it's likely getting net exported out later on in the life cycle of these species. And we can estimate um, how much nitrogen on eelgrass um, bed or amount of eelgrass in a system can take up using published estimates from um, various sources, including Aoki et al. 2020 and Pedersen and Borum from 1993. And we find that when we calculate or apply that uptake rate to the amount of eelgrass um, found in Great Bay on average, um, there's an average of three to 35 grams of nitrogen being taken up per square meter per year. And that accounts for between six and 86% of our delta storage term calculated by the um, black box model, which indicates that it is plausible that um, uptake by primary producers is accounting for some of this net retention that we're seeing. Additionally, dissolved inorganic nitrogen retention is really driven by temperature dependent processes, whether it's biotic assimilation by plants or microbial denitrification processes happening in the summer. Um, and so if we look at our dissolved inorganic nitrogen storage values over by month on average over the last 10 years, um, we first see that there's not a statistically significant difference um, between our monthly average um, delta storage terms, but our two highest means indicated by the green circles occur in our warmer months in August and in September indicating that more of our retention may be happening in the summer when things are growing and doing well versus in the really cold New England winters. And we find that other studies have um, seen similar results. Um, so for example, in the James River estuary in Virginia, um, they found that retention, which for the purposes of comparison is delta storage in my model, is positive or peaks in the summer months over time and becomes negative or um, a negative delta storage term in the winter. And if we think about our DIN retention within Great Bay in the context of primary productivity rates for Great Bay, we find that they correspond or occur in the same seasons 
um, with our monthly primary productivity rates peaking in the late summer. And so this is a figure of um, net ecosystem metabolism in black, primary product production in green and respiration in blue. Um, the respiration is negative because it indicates the consumption of oxygen. So as it gets more negative, you're consuming more oxygen. So more oxygen is gone from the system. But we see that the spikes in the green, which indicate production rates, are the highest in our summer months or in the middle of the year, indicating that our primary productivity is lining up with our highest retention rates in the summer. Additionally, or similarly to dissolved inorganic nitrogen, we see that phosphorus is also um, being retained in Great Bay with our average inputs shown in purple again on the uh, left graph and our average outputs for a given year being shown on the blue bars. And we see inputs are greater than outputs once again, resulting in most years a very positive delta storage term or nearly zero in balancing out within the system. And what's really interesting about our nitrogen, our inorganic nutrients, is that they exhibit opposite seasonal patterns. So this is a big graph page, so just bear with me. Um, on the top left, we have our monthly dissolved inorganic nitrogen inputs um, with our letters indicating the results of our post hoc 2P test and months sharing a letter are not statistically different from one another. On the bottom left, we have our dissolved inorganic nitrogen output or our low tide flux out on average by month. On the top right, we have our phosphate inputs. Um, again, with our post hoc 2P test results, months sharing a letter are not statistically different from one another. And then on the bottom right, we have our phosphate outputs um, shown in blue. And if we look at this and we start just on the dissolved inorganic nitrogen side, we see that we have um, higher DIN um, inputs and outputs in the spring, and they reach this low in July or in the summer months. Whereas in uh, the phosphorus trend by month, we see that phosphorus starts out low for both its input yield and its uh, output yield and increases and reaches a peak in the summer months. And this opposite behavior is likely an indication of a switch in nutrient limitation. And so I went ahead and calculated N to P ratios um, for both our input loads shown on the top panel and our output load shown on the bottom panel by month going from March to December. Um, and this is in moles. And then the red line indicates Redfield's ratio of 16 to one, which is what um, marine plankton biomass is roughly usually has in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus. And we can see that in the spring, for both our inputs and our outputs, on average for our box and whisker, our medians are above our redfield ratio, indicating phosphorus limitation. Where in the summer, we switch um, and become nitrogen, limi nitrogen limited for both our inputs and our outputs, indicating that something's happening in the system that's shifting the productivity. Um, and some we've depleted our nitrogen to a point where we've become limited for growth. And if we look at our chlorophyll A concentrations in Great Bay in comparison um, to our N to P ratios by month, we see the spike in chlorophyll A concentrations in the spring months and then a decrease down in the summer months. And so it's very likely that um, chlorophyll A growing in the, in the early spring when um, we have higher rainfall and higher wastewater treatment effluent coming into the system is growing because it has sufficient nitrogen and it's doing great, and then it uses up so much nitrogen and switches our system to become slightly nitrogen limited, uh, which also can correspond with in the summer, a lot of wastewater treatment facilities do try to reduce their effluent loads. Finally, if we look at dissolved organic carbon, we find that it fluctuates with net ecosystem metabolism, and it varies from year to year, with some years showing inputs being greater than outputs and other years showing inputs being less than outputs meaning sometimes we're a net importer of DOC and sometimes we're a net exporter of DOC. And this is likely an indication of the production and consumption of organic matter within the system. So if we look at our annual average net ecosystem metabolism, we see that in some years we are net autotrophic and those are highlighted in green, meaning we're producing oxygen. And in some years we're net heterotrophic and we're consuming oxygen and consuming organic matter. 
And if we compare our DOC box model variables to our net ecosystem metabolism, we find that if we look at our annual DOC input loads um, on the x-axis and our mean annual respiration, that ecosystem respiration increases with increasing DOC inputs. And I did not say that wrong, let me explain. Our x-axis is negative, but that as it becomes more negative, that means we're seeing higher respiration rates. So it's a little counterintuitive, but we're seeing more respiration and more consumption of oxygen as we have more input of DOC or labile carbon into the system. Opposite of that, we see that as our mean annual primary production increases on our x-axis or our photosynthetic capacity of the system increases, we see a higher output DOC load, meaning as there's more photosynthesis, there's more plants creating biomass, and that biomass can likely be incorporated into some of our DOC output we're seeing from the estuary as it breaks down and becomes detritus. And so with that, we can come to some conclusions. The first um, question I asked for my research was how do inputs of retention and outputs of nutrients, carbon, and suspended sediment solids vary temporally in Great Bay? And we found that there was a net export of particulate nutrients and sediments from the system and a net import of dissolved inorganic nutrients. And this is likely due to, um, or this difference between our net export and our net import of particulate and dissolved fractions respectively is likely suggesting that primary productivity in estuaries like Great Bay is getting fueled by terrestrial nutrient fluxes. So nitrogen or phosphorus is coming in from our wastewater treatment plants coming down river getting incorporated into our primary producer biomass, whether that's eelgrass or our macroalgae competitors. Some of that um, primary producer biomass dies off, becomes detritus, and it gets exported out of the system as particulate nitrogen. And while our eelgrass decline and our DIN loads were not directly strongly related in this study, it's likely um, that DIN is in loading is indirectly influencing our eelgrass through the stimulation of our light competitors. And that's evidenced by the fact that we're retaining a lot of nitrogen despite eelgrass decline within Great Bay. Additionally, um, we found uh, when we looked at patterns in water quality relative to biotic response, this fluctuation between our net import and our net export of carbon indicates that in some years, we're rapidly consuming a lot of that terrestrial carbon and within Great Bay, we're seeing internal in situ production to make up any gaps in that DOC. And in those years, that is potentially informing our export of marine DOC. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge my amazing committee members that have you know, been there for me during our year of work for home. Um, Michelle Shattuck, Allison Harrod, uh, the UNH Water Quality Lab, Chris Peter for inviting me to a net ecosystem metabolism course so that I could learn to do it. Um, the Great Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve and my friends and family. And funding for this work was provided by the NOAA Margaret A. Davidson Graduate Research Fellowship. And with that, I would love to take your questions. Great, thank you.